Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I hope you all have had a nice week. I'm going to start off with admitting something about myself that's kind of self-deprecating and kind of um, um, simple. So when it our our theme for today is All Saints Day and everything, um, and our our scripture focus for today, as you've heard, is the Beatitudes. So all through my childhood, and I got to admit, probably. A lot of my young adult years since technically I don't qualify as a young adult anymore, um, which kind of, anyway, uh, I won't go there. At 50, you're still not a young adult. But anyway, um, so I always kind of looked at the B attitudes as different things, like a list that I could choose from. Um, for example, um, do I want to inherit the kingdom of heaven? Okay, well, I need to do this. But if I want to be comforted, then I need to do that. And if I want to inherit the land, so earth, I guess I should do that. In other words, each item is kind of mutually exclusive. Now, I'm sure I'm not the only one that has thought that in the past. But as I have you know, delved in it, because I think I gave a sermon on the Beatitudes once before or something. But as I've gotten older, I've looked at that and I go, no, it's not really a list of individual things. It's that we're supposed to be all those things. Um, and so I just kind of find that humorous that I guess when I was younger, I made it so simple that not necessarily a multiple choice thing, but you can choose one, but that excludes the other. So the items are mutually exclusive. Um, and particularly today, I'm going to focus somewhat on that concept. Um, and, and reflecting, since this is the beginning of the Sermon of the Mount um, speech, you know, that this sermon um, is probably, um, and, and I read this someplace in one of the things, it's probably the most significant discourse or sermons or speeches that Christ gave in the Bible, if you really think about it. Just pause and think about what you remember of what Jesus has done in the New Testament all the way through. This is a pretty important sermon. In so many ways, it's actually revolutionary um, and what he's teaching and what it means. And really, it is his very first sermon. Um, I mean, he gets baptized, then he goes out for 40 days and 40 nights and fasts in the wilderness and gets tempted, you know, by the devil. And then he comes back and he sees the multitude that are following him all around the Gal Galilee area um, and eventually ends up by the Sea of Galilee and he goes up a mountain right? And he uh, then begins to give this sermon. So it's the first thing he really leads his ministry off with. And the first part of this sermon is the Beatitudes. So it must be really important, and it should be something we really remember, because all you're going to remember, just like me when I hear sermons, is really the first part and the last part, right? Um, the middle part gets all kind of confusing. You know, the gospel um, has a number of scriptures in it that refer to mountains. Um, and when it talks about all the different stories about mountains, Old Testament and New Testament, I mean, think about how the Lord commanded Abraham to sacrifice Isaac on top of the Mount Moriah. Um, and here or there, Abraham was taught of the interceding power of the Messiah. But what about Mount Sinai and Moses, right, going up and getting the Ten Commandments and the ordinances relating to how the tabernacle would work? Or what about Mark, uh, Mount Carmel, and a lot where Elijah showed the power of God by calling down fire from heaven? Or even Noah landing the ark, right, and then getting... Uh, God's everlasting covenant in the form of the rainbow, um, that he wouldn't destroy the world by the flood again. And shall I dare even say, although let's be honest, it's somewhat controversial, even within our congregation, Joseph Smith getting the golden or brass plates on Hill Cumorah. Each one of these mountains, or a hill, I guess, right, act as a, as a bridge, both metaphorically and perhaps um, an actual life, so to speak, about bringing the heavens 
and God closer to us um, as as a people and earth. Um, each one of these stories is about an God wanting to develop an intimate relationship with us. So whenever you hear a story in the Bible that frequently involves a mountain, something intimate and personal is about to happen. And in that regards, today being Communion Sunday, if we were in church, just think about what we even do to this day. You know, we have different symbols that we put in our sanctuary, right? But one of the big symbols is our communion table, or kind of like an altar that we put up front on top of a rostrum, right? Um, in the front, you know, it's raised. And so, you know, Although we don't necessarily go up, we have the communion come down and be served from the mountain to us. So again, and communion being, you know, the, the body and the blood of Christ, symbolically speaking, again, every once, every month, we kind of do the same thing. We go to the mountain, right? Not only are we renewing our baptismal covenant that we want to be in an intimate relationship with God, but we're professing publicly that we want to be a disciple of Jesus, so as I reflect upon the eight B attitudes specifically, I started realizing how it's not the B attitudes. I kind of, for me anyway, it's kind of a misnomer. I think they should actually be called, and here's a new, I think it's a new term I'm coining, the eight commandments of the New Testament. Because they really should be compared juxtaposed to the Ten Commandments of the Old Testament. But let's go with the word be attitudes for a moment. What exactly is the definition of an attitude? That's how I started out. So I looked up the definition and it says to be blessed, prosperous, or abundant. Now I want you to hold on to the definition of prosperous for just a moment um, and think about that in relation to the be attitudes. Remember, the Old Testament is a long list of thou shalt nots, right? And parenting, you can do negative reinforcement or you can do positive reinforcement. And when you're doing positive reinforcement, it gives you the concept that the be attitudes Christ is talking about is kind of the positive reinforcement, right? And thou shalt nots are kind of negative reinforcement, right? Um, and in that respect, the positives, the be attitudes, the eight New Testament commandments of Christ um, are really directed towards us integrating something deep into our personality, deep into who we are, and filling them in our soul so that they're just a naturally, all of them, a part of who we are. I mean, think, blessed are the merciful, the pure of heart, the peacemakers, right? The meek, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Those aren't things that are just on a checklist that you can do once and say, okay, I did it, boom, I taken care of. I mean, how does one exactly become merciful? How does one become um, pure in heart. It's not a checklist. It's a way of living. Perhaps one of the reasons why the teachings of Jesus within the Sermon on the Mount are so rev revolutionary, Jesus, in essence, breaks every perceived concept of what it means to be truly blessed and prosperous, going back to the definition. I mean, he teaches it is not through obtaining wealth or power, as most Romans would have seen being blessed and prosperous. And I dare say a fair number of people, American citizens to this very day. If you ask the average person on the street, how do you become prosperous? The conversation goes to money, not to what Jesus is talking about. How about um, it's not even through the strict obedience of the law, as most scribes and Pharisees probably would have seen it, right? And how many 
ministers, televangelists, and other churches, not picking on anyone really in particular, have you heard espouse something that that says, yeah, to be pure of heart, to be really good with God, you got to obey the commandments, right? It's actually in the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus says it's through becoming meek, lowly, hungering after righteousness, being merciful, and a peacemaker. Now, today's All Saints Day. And when you reflect, I like the exercise we did earlier about um, think about someone who loved God with all their heart, someone who taught me about God, someone who humbly served God, someone whose faith in God is what you want to emulate. It's probably because they were meek, lowly, hungering after righteousness, being merciful and a peacemaker, not because they were prosperous in the sense of what the world would say. So in short, the state of being blessed and being prosperous that Jesus is talking about is about who we really are and not what we do. Who we really are and not what we do. It is only by having the character that Jesus tells us to have that we are able to follow in Christ's footsteps which means we take up his mantle as Christians, as people who are baptized, as people who take communion every Sunday, as people who look up to the, the role models we have in our faith community and in church and historically in religion, um, the saints, that we look and see what was it that they were doing? What was their mission? Well, as Steve Vesey frequently shares, in Nazareth's synagogue on a Sabbath, Jesus unrolls the scroll in Luke 4 and says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of the sight to the blind and let the oppressed go free to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. So we're saying that that is Christ's declaration of his mission. But can you do that mission if you don't follow the the beatitudes the eight commandments of the new testament if it's not so integrated into your personality that it just comes out naturally or you can think of it this way as i've been reflecting on it if you have all of these within your personality you're going to naturally be doing christ's mission but today's world's complicated isn't it i mean our politics the election but just working in the work world as my own wife is finding out, it is complicated. And from a practical standpoint, how do we really live out Christ's mission? Well, in Matthew 23, Christ goes on in his sermon to say things like, the scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat. Therefore, do whatever they teach you and follow it. So he's in essence saying we do need to follow our leaders. You do need to respect them. But he goes on to say, but new, do not do as they do, for they do not practice what they teach. They tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on the shoulders of others. In other words, they blame other people for the problems. And he's saying, don't do that, right? They're unwilling to lift a finger to move them. So they're not willing to help. They do all these deeds to be seen by others. And he goes into, basically, they're doing this to be famous. They want to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and have people call them rabbi. But you are not to be called rabbi, for you have one teacher and you are all students. And, of course, who's our teacher, right? And call no one your father on earth, for you have one father, the one who is in heaven. Nor are you to be called instructors for you have one instructor, the Messiah. The greatest among you will be your servant, and all who exalt themselves will be humbled, and all who humble themselves will be exalted. I find that to be a very practical interpretation. So what we have here, and what I'm saying, is we have the eight new commandments of the New Testament that are telling us what our personality is supposed to be like. 
what we are supposed to be trying to instill in our children. I hope I'm doing that. And not just one of them, not just two, it's not a list you get to pick from, but all of them. And then we have Christ's mission, what you do with it. And then we have a practical explanation of how that is presented in the real world. We have to respect people. But just because you respect them doesn't mean you can't disagree, but you got to disagree respectfully. So as we participate in communion with each other today and with God, as we take the sacrament of the Lord's Supper, as we recommit ourselves to following Christ's mission, I hope that we can also recommit ourselves to becoming a new creation as we claim we become in the waters of baptism, as we partake of communion every month, and that we can become a new creation with a new character that is defined by the eight New Testament commandments and the examples of practical living that Christ gave us. And for that, this has got to be the shortest sermon I've ever given. So I'm done. <laughs>